The book of Mark, which was our text was read from today, begins in the region of Galilee where Jesus grew up. Much of his ministry takes place there. You remember it. He turned water into wine in Cana. That's in Galilee. Mary Magdalene was from Magdala. That's in Galilee. Capernaum, where there was the casting out of demons and healings, which was really Jesus' headquarters, was in Galilee. And his first preaching tour was through the towns of Galilee. And not only that, he picks up Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John, his inner core of leadership and the disciples, alongside the Sea of Galilee where they were fixing their nets and he turns to them and says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news and follow me. And son of a gun, (laughs) they dropped their nets and they went and they followed him. It's hard to know why they did. Was it that they were caught up in the fervor to overthrow Rome and they interpreted the kingdom of God to be something that would conquer the kingdom of Caesar? The disciples' actions throughout the book seem to confirm this hypothesis. They were the ones refusing the children a blessing from Jesus. They were the ones arguing about who would have the left and right hand uh, beside Jesus' throne when he came into his kingdom. They were the ones that were rebuking Jesus himself when he talked of crosses and suffering and, and death. The disciples appeared to be concerned only with having a good time, thus missing the deeper message of Jesus. But I can't judge them harshly because I'm not really any different than they are. My wife Sally and I went to the same college as freshmen in the same year, though she's 51 weeks older than I am. (laughs) But who's counting? She had been an exchange student in Sweden for a year. Thus, we ended up in college at the same time. In Scandinavia, they had the miniskirt revolution before we did, and she brought it with her back to our college campus (laughs) with her long legs. That fall semester, we didn't date, but we met up at George's restaurant across the street from the school, That's when I noticed the mini skirt and the legs. George, the owner, and his wife Helen were from Greece. And Helen saw herself as the mother in absentia to all the students who came in. When we sat down, she looked at us and said, You two look good. Are you lovebirds? No, I said quickly, no, we're not lovebirds. Our our families are friends, and we've just re-met after a long time, and we ordered our burgers and Cokes, and that fall we met up at George's several times during the semester. I'm slow. When the Valentine's di- dinner came along in February, I, I uh, finally asked her out officially. Well, sort of officially. I didn't do it in person. But in a long, convoluted note filled with what I thought were very clever puns and rhymes. <clears throat> I'm not sure she thought the same thing. But Sally overlooked the fact that I had not asked her in person, but through a socially stunted invitation. And graciously, she said yes. And we became an item. In fact, we became, over the next year and a half, the couple on campus. Everyone knew we were together. Everyone liked us together. 
It was great. And I was having a wonderful time in college, which doesn't mean necessarily studying. I was in what I called my ping pong years. I played a lot. I was also a philosophy major. So I bought a pipe and I let the smoke drift up around my head while I pondered the truths of the universe. The civil rights movement was at its peak and many students got involved, but me, I started a group called Fun People on Campus. (laughs) What was I thinking? So I can't judge the disciples harshly for wanting to be fun people who follow Jesus. The disciples had their own ping pong years, I mean, Jesus preaching and healing and the crowds growing, dreams of conquering Rome and sitting at the right and the left of Jesus, him on his throne, all of which led up to that great parade on Palm Sunday. But to be fair, the disciples also must have been drawn to Jesus, to follow Jesus because of the aroma of God's love that came through him. They must have been amazed that he threatened the temple religion's judgmental ways, that he, an Israelite prophet, healed a Roman military officer's daughter from the occupying nation, no less, that he included the poor and the outcast in God's economy, he included the lower class, that he, a man with authority, elevated women, to an equal level with men when they were thought to be simply the servant gender. You see, Jesus was trying to get them to imagine what up to this point no one else had yet imagined. A world with no religions, no nations, no class system, no gender inequality. All those things which separate people from one another. This is what John Lennon was trying to say in his song that the Red Hots sang today. Imagine no religion. The disciples followed this aroma of love, but they didn't know its cost. And then the church or the temple and the state and the men of the upper class crucified Jesus to retain their power. And for Peter and Andrew and James and John, the fun was finished, it seemed, and the disciples fled for their lives. After dating Sally a year and a half into our junior year, the fun was finished for me. I thought I had gotten tired of her, so I broke up with her. My timing was not all that good. She had a broken leg and was sitting in a wheelchair when I did the deed. I know all of you women are going to stone me when we, after this service. Not only was my timing bad, my words, my speech was very bad as well. I said to her, I think we should date around for a while. What was I thinking? Oh my goodness. Really, she said, you think we should date around for a while? I'm in a wheelchair and you think we should date around for a while. I see. And she wheeled her chair around and whisked away. And it all blew up in my face. The whole campus hated me. I was an idiot. Sally was the poor cast-off girl with a broken leg. (laughs) And that ticked me off. No way was anybody going to force me back into that relationship. And I held out. And three months later, I ended up in George's restaurant, sitting in that same booth where Sally and I first sat. And Helen, George's wife, 
she brought my order, and she asked, where are your girlfriend? I said, well, I broke up with her. She said, you no like her anymore? No, no, I, I like her. Oh, she no like you. <laughs> I said, well, she didn't like that I broke up with her. Oh, Helen said, then you no love her anymore, right? And I was stuck. I was stuck, you see, because I couldn't say that I didn't love her. I mean, I thought I was tired of her, but, but I wasn't. What I realized was I was tired of me. I was tired of the ping pong years. I was tired of simply having a good time and appearing to be smart with the smoke winding around my head. The truth was I missed her. I missed her bright spirit. And the way that she could make fun of me. <laughs> Helen put the plate down on the table. Now you listen to Helen. If you no love her, it over. But if you love her, it no over. It just gets started. In Greece, we have a saying. When love leads you to a cliff, you jump. And that was it, of course. Love had led me to a cliff. It was useless to continue as sweethearts, as wonderful as it was being the campus couple. It was as wonderful as her mini skirts and long legs were. But I was afraid to jump into where love was leading. I was afraid to leave my fun-loving, happy-go-lucky ping-pong years and be led by love into deeper places and to trust that love would not leave me alone or leave us alone. The ending of the book of Mark, read today as our text, is abrupt and ambiguous. The women come to the tomb and the stone is rolled away and there's a man in white clothing that says, Jesus is not here, he's been raised. Go tell the disciples that Jesus is going ahead of them to Galilee and there you will see him. But the women leave afraid. And did you hear what the last sentence was? They told no one. Did you get that? The women leave the tomb afraid. The man tells them to go tell the disciples that Jesus is going before them to Galilee and they need to get up there and see him. And they're so afraid that the book ends by saying they didn't tell anybody. What kind of an ending is that? Now, if you look in your Bible, you'll see that there are two endings right after this. Those two endings are added later by the early church because they didn't trust what Mark had done. They looked at this and they said, well, this is a little crazy. You know, if the women didn't tell anybody, how did anybody know? How did anybody get up to Galilee? So they wrote up these resurrection appearances to prove to us, you know, that, hey, this thing really happened, you know. But they didn't have the courage that Mark did because Mark was up to something good. Mark retrieved the very beginning of the book. The whole thing began in Galilee. Jesus was brought up in Galilee. His ministry began in Galilee. And he's not sending them to the holy city, Jerusalem. No, he's sending them back to the backwaters of Galilee. Why? Because on that three-day walk that they have to take to Galilee, 
they are going to be talking about their entire three years with Jesus on the road. And all of these acts of love and peace and justice that they have witnessed, that aroma fills their nose, their heads, their hearts. And when they get there, who knows exactly what happened? But they knew something. That they had come to the edge of a cliff. That love had led them to the edge of a cliff. And now the question was, were they going to jump? If love leads you to the edge of a cliff, jump! Of course, the book's written 40 years later. And all kinds of things had already happened. And so they knew, really, that they had jumped. That they had left their ping pong years. They'd gone to the deeper place of Jesus' message where we understand there's a cost to love. But that doesn't mean that you don't jump. There was a cliff in Galilee. The disciples jumped off the cliff. If you don't jump off the cliff, you don't see the resurrection. If you don't jump off the cliff, you don't see the resurrection. Fall of our senior year in college, Sally and I went into George's restaurant and sat down on that same booth. Sally held up her hand when Helen came over. There was a ring on the finger. Helen turned and looked at me and said, You jumped! (laughs) And yes, I did. We did. And we've been falling for 43 years. That's the thing. When love leads you to a cliff and you jump... You don't know where the bottom is, but you trust. You trust that the love of God will support you. You trust in the power of the resurrection. How about you, my friends? Is the aroma of God's love leading you to a cliff? Don't be afraid. The risen Christ goes before you to Granby, to Simsbury, to Granville, to your house, to your neighborhood, and to your workplace. And when God's love leads you to the cliff of someone's loneliness, you jump. And when God's love leads you to the cliff of social prejudice, you jump. And when God's love leads you to the cliff of hatred, you jump. And when God's love leads you to a deeper commitment in your own life, you jump off that cliff. Because if you don't jump, you won't see the resurrection. Because if you don't jump, You won't see the resurrection. But if you jump, 